What's up, everybody? Izzy again with another Q&A today. I want to apologize in advance for the audio on some of these. I don't know why I sound like a librarian reading a flyer, but I guess that's what I sound like when I'm in a hospital. And I did not realize how loud the background noise was. So uh, tomorrow, I will make sure that that is not the case. I will turn the background down even more. I had it at like 20% on most of these, but it sounds like it needs to be like 10. And uh, I don't know how much I can do about the librarian hospital voicing, but... I guess the plus is if I'm in the hospital all day, I'm answering questions most of the day. So we'll see. After weighing in for a power lifting meet, how do you avoid a sugar crash? I'm gonna keep eating and keep drinking, really. Uh, it just really isn't that big of a concern in my experience. Uh, you should be eating um, meals basically like every two hours after you weigh in. And even if it's the same day weigh in, you're gonna be having a feeding, something like 50 to 100 grams of carbs and 15 to 20 grams of protein, minimal fat, um, salted. And you're just going to keep doing that throughout the duration of the contest. And on top of that, you have to keep in mind that the athlete, whether they're natural or enhanced, is going to be jacked up on as they're pretty much max tolerable stimulant dose. Like the max amount of caffeine that they can use without it negatively affecting performance should be used on meat day. This is normally a time when I would use the doctor filter, but that's not funny to me today. So all I can really tell you is... Sometimes these things are going to happen. If you, if you train hard, you know, for years and years and years, you will pick up little injuries. And you'll have no idea what happened. The good news is that these kind of injuries usually go away really fast. So just for a while, avoid any movements that hurt. And I bet you within like a week, you know, that'll be completely gone. Is the current way that you train what you personally find most enjoyable? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think even people that do RIR training don't do it because it's more fun than high intensity training. Like, I, anybody that loves training is not going to find RIR training more fun than failure training. The people that do RIR training, reps and reserve, RPE, it's because they think it works better. It's not because it's more fun. I mean, going all out and leaving nothing in the tank if you like to work is one of the most rewarding ways that you can train. Now, personally, right now, I'm dealing with like a lot of injuries or I don't know you really call them injuries but imbalances like right to left so I have to do a lot of machines and I would prefer to be doing more free weights but yeah I love the way that I train for sure how do you decide between rotating a movement out versus doing a form reset so first of all I don't really know why you're juxtaposing these two things I guess I don't use them for equivalent purposes I do a form reset anytime I audit my form and I determine that it's substandard or it has become in some way poor enough that it's reducing the SFR of the movement significantly. I swap a movement out and that movement has actually become stale. So I can't progress it anymore. Um, or sometimes like it starts hurting my joints too bad and there's no way to fix it with a technique change. How to increase the range of motion on a machine chest presses? So I'm going to try to answer this again with the background noise turned off. Um, I wouldn't use a foam roller for the most part. It's too hard and the shape of it is such that it's going to like sit right between your scapulas and cause some weirdness there. I would look at something that's either softer, like a, a bunched up yoga mat, or flatter, like a, the top part of stackable aerobic steps. But the other thing to keep in mind too is like this is not that important. Yes, added range of motion, <clears throat> stretch medium hypertrophy. It improves SFR, but all the biggest people in the world, when they bench press with a bar or with dumbbells, none of them are using the exaggerated full ROM. So sometimes you can just pick a movement that isn't full ROM. If powerlifting training methods are better today, why were powerlifters more jacked in the 70s? Dude, this makes no sense. This is like saying, if bodybuilders are better today, how come bodybuilders in the 70s could lift heavier on the squat bench and deadlift? Uh, powerlifting is about your total. It's not about being jacked. So. I guess all you really have to do is look at the record books and you can see that the records from the 70s for the most part uh, have been annihilated some of that's equipment some of it's training what is your opinion on hoist equipment <clears throat> i don't have a general opinion really about any equipment manufacturer except for maybe prime every piece of equipment is going to come down to a case-by-case -case basis uh, the hoist stuff you're talking about like the rocket line where you move with it i think the pull down is pretty cool the curl and one of the rows but uh, you know here's my general thing if it's bad or mediocre equipment free weights are way better if it's great equipment the machine is marginally better than free weights so pick it based on what gym has good free weights is there any way to calculate one rep maxes on machines just like you would for free weights or you know use the rep maxes to 
equate performances? And the answer is yes. You can literally use the exact same coefficients and formulas that you use for free weights that you do on machines. Um, they work relatively well across all movements. It's just every single movement is going to be slightly different. But yeah, it works well enough. So yeah, you can use the coefficient chart that I'm posting here and compare you know a five rep on a machine to a 10 rep on a machine and it works reasonably well enough can the landmine squat replace the hack squat as a home gym alternative uh no not even close how much weight can you even put on a landmine squat like five or six plates before you run out of space on the bar no you can't can't go as heavy and the main thing that makes a hack squat so great for quads is that there's a back pad that literally prevents your hips from shooting back and taking over it forces you with a, with a pad to stay in your quads so there's no technique and at the same time that there's no technique you still get maximal quads without any effort like a, like you would on a back squat about thinking about keeping your hips forward nothing can replace a hack squat nothing except for maybe a pendulum squat but definitely not a headline squat all right, I lied about the doctor filter. I feel too much pressure in my throat when I breathe. How to fix if it is a problem? What in the world made you think that asking the lifting guy this question made sense? When did I become an expert on breathing? You want to know something about sets, reps, technique, building muscle, getting strong? Sure. Breathing? No. Is it cheating to take extra breaths at the end of a set to failure? It's not cheating per se, but it is an intensity technique. It's a way of going beyond failure. They're not, you need to make a notation of it because it's not the same thing. Like take this to the absolute extreme, right? Let's say somebody's doing deadlifts and they just let the bar rest on the ground for 15, 20 seconds between each rep. At that point, you're doing a cluster set of singles. You're not doing a continuous uh, rep set, right? So you need to make a similar kind of notation. My personal rule about this is no more than three breaths. Otherwise, it counts as a rest, pause, intensifier, ex set extension. So you need to make a similar rule for yourself in order to standardize your sets. If you're, you know, sitting there breathing for 15 seconds before your final hack squat rep, clearly it's not the same as all the reps that came before. Are front squats useful for increasing your back squat in powerlifting? Have you used them before? I've used them before extensively, and I don't think they're the best choice. Number one is people often say that front squats are more quad than high bar, and that's false. When you bring the bar to the front of your body, it actually shortens the moment arm between the bar and the knees. They're harder on the thoracic extensors, and they have very, very high mobility thresholds. But here's the thing. If you want to keep the movement quad focused, you just can't let your hips shoot back. And you can do that with a heels elevated high bar squat. Just cue hips forward and don't let them shoot back. In my experience, it tends to be the people who need front squats the least that are best built for it. And what I mean by that is people who have long torsos and short femurs, relatively speaking, and can already squat upright and already have a quad dominant squat, have very nice looking front squats that carry over to their back squats. But the people who have longer limbs and shorter torsos cannot produce a reasonable looking front squat most of the time. And for these people, it's my opinion that the best option, rather than continually banging your head against a wall and fighting your natural instincts to use more adductor, to use more hips, is to just get on a hack squat and do a movement that forces you to stay in your quads, that forces quad growth. And in my experience, hack squat is the number one piece of carryover equipment to a back squat if you have long legs. Why are you so huge? Well, that's obviously because I scream while playing the tournament. For those who don't understand this joke, there are not many videos. And for one, the title that says something about me getting tattled on by other team members for screaming while they very On a completely unrelated note, the Dumbbell Preacher Crawl has to be one of my absolute favorite bicep movements right now. The, the Preacher Bench itself basically really prevents any kind of cheating, especially if you move your elbow down towards the bottom of the pad and get your full arm on there. So it's, right, but it's all bicep and the Dumbbell itself allows your wrist to turn, so just great movement. Is two sets of three the same stimulus with less fatigue versus one set of six? Not even close, where'd you get that? First of all, you could use the effective reps model, so the last five reps before failure are the stimulated ones, and instead of six to failure, there's five stimulated reps. In two sets of three, there's only four stimulated reps. Further, uh, beyond that, the 
the reps closest to failure are both the most stimulative and the most fatiguing. So it's very likely that the single set of six is more stimulus and more fatigue than two sets of, sub, of three that are submaximal. I have worsening preset anxiety. Should I just get over it? I'm still making good progress though. Um, here's the thing, I don't wanna be insensitive because I'm not a therapist or a mental health professional. But if you're making good progress, I would say, you know, you're on the right track. There's a very thin line between the right level of arousal to train hard and anxiety. It's a very, very thin line. If the set that you're about to do doesn't scare you to some degree, either in terms of how much effort you're going to have to put forth to do a good job and beat what you did last time, or just because it's something you've never touched before and the heaviness of it is scary, I mean, maybe you're just not doing things that are challenging enough. So some anxiety is good. If you're training for hypertrophy, you should minimize the time between deadlift reps. I mean, especially if you're resting on the ground, because if you're resting on the ground, there's absolutely zero tension there. You are literally just recovering. I use the three breath rule on every lift, which is if I have to breathe more than three times before I do the next rep, I count that as a mile rep set extension. So I'll write like plus one. Um, it doesn't count as a set, it's a cluster at that point. But yeah, I mean, minimize your time between reps as much as possible. Here's an example of how I do it here. So I am back from the hospital for the day. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any good or like conclusive news to share. It turns out this is probably not appendicitis. So it's gonna be a couple more days um, before there's any resolution. I will neglect to go into the details of the nightmare that ensued uh, in the past 24 hours though. Um, either way, <laughs> she's feeling better now and is stable. So hopefully, um, there's a clear cut resolution in the next couple of days. And when that happens, I will provide an update on it. But for now, uh, it's still just trying to get healthy. All right, everybody, that is all I got for you today. As always, if you like the video, like the video. If you have any questions for me, just put them in the comments below. I'll probably just directly answer them in the comments. And uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And enjoy the rest of your day, friends. Bye-bye. Oh, and thank you very much to everyone who has reached out with well wishes.